All right. We got Neil Edelberg, Maryland wrestling, Mount St. Joe leader and former coach. How you doing, Neil? Hi, Jay. Thanks for doing this. You have a beautiful setup there. I just wish we had a nice fire going for the fireside chat. Yeah, that would have been really, really <laughs> convenient and nice. <laughs> but tell me earlier about that picture up there, which is funny. Can you tell me a, a little bit about that picture? Well, that's one of our Fargo teams. I, I'm not, I, I can't see it clearly, but it's uh, one of the first few where we put the path to Fargo in place and uh, had a nice group of Maryland wrestlers. Uh, which which one is that? I, I, I can't tell from here. What the year? one that is, uh, it looks like two Greek wrestlers. Oh, that picture. I thought yeah. you were talking about the path to Fargo picture. I'm well, sorry. that's an interesting one because it was hanging at the Colat Wrestling Club and when we shut down, I took it out of there, obviously. It's a nice, it's a framed, it's, it's nice, so I took it. Well, I think I framed it myself, but I, when I was coaching at St. Joe, I wanted the kids to get exposure to uh, European wrestling and uh, put together a program where we sent Harry Barnaby and uh, John Hefner to Poland to train and compete. And uh, it really did a lot for their, uh, it was a good evidence that learning Greco, that I think they spent most of their time doing Greco, really helps uh, folk style. And uh, I think John or Harry, or both of them brought that back for me. And I, I had it framed, I ha always had it in my office. And then I put it into uh, the Colat Training Center. And oh, nice. looks very good right there. That's really nice. Yeah, it does, it does. Well, I appreciate it because it ends up in my house now. And <laughs> yeah, well, until you're my age, then you'll turn it over to one of your protégés. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How's everything going through uh, quarantine, COVID? You, you been out? I keep busy. I, uh, I have my chickens, so I have to take care of them every day. I have four chickens. All right. Yeah. Uh, so I get uh, two dozen eggs a week that I have trouble finding people to take them all. If anybody needs any fresh farm <laughs> eggs. Anybody there. near Maryland, Rice's Town. <laughs> they're, they're delicious and uh, only organically fed and, uh, and they're very friendly. They, they like, they know me and like me. You know, the chickens, they have a, they have a brain and they, uh, they have emotion. They know who I am. They know, I actually, they know I'm bringing them food most of the time, but <laughs> they're nice. And I have fish. I have a, I have six acres here. So I have a, nice. have a lot to deal with. Uh, and now I'm, I'm I just purchased a drone. So I'm, uh, I'm beginning oh, okay. the, the drone habit. And it, I bought the uh, DJI Mavic two, which is an unbelievable drone. Um, it can travel six miles from the controller. So it's wow. really got a tremendous uh, connectivity to the, to the uh, controller. And um, I'm using it. I wanted to have video of my property and see it from the air and had it out today. And the, the colors of the trees are starting to, starting to really get nice here. So that I'm gonna uh, be getting, actually the first person who got that was Kerry Colat. He bought one and he's using it at Navy. I don't know if you've seen his uh, videos lately. I did. I did. He, he called Kyle Tribus one night and said, Kyle, you want to learn how to use a drone? And Kyle would never say no to, to <laughs> carry. <laughs> and uh, he said, sure. And he bought him this drone. And now uh, the wrestling room at Navy um, is showing video of the, the guys warming up and going live and, and the drone really makes it exciting and interesting. He just did one the other day, um, the new era, beginning a new era. And, uh, and Kyle has a lot of uh, skill, video skill, which I don't have yet. But I saw that, I saw that. It's really amazing. Uh, and that room is like perfect for a drone because the tall, tall ceilings and you got the space to have it fly around and, and look yeah. Yeah, looking down from above was really neat. And then he brings it down lower and had them uh, parallel to where they were shooting. So he, he did a nice mixture, puts it to music. It was really exciting. I think the recruits that Gary's gotten, I've seen a couple of them comment on social media that can't wait to get into that room. You know, it's really, <laughs> it's really exciting things going on down at the academy. Gary's always been able to just expose and, and, and deliver really, really even more than, than what, who he is. Like, I remember like, back in the training center in Coggesville, he would have a, uh, 
he'd always have a camera set up and he would broadcast yeah. through the uh, ancient ways of sending social media out to the Great. public <laughs> and uh, people would log on. I, I used to go over just because I enjoy watching him teach his technique and, uh, yep. and, uh, and he was always sending it out and, and you were there helping him. So that was, he was, uh, yeah, he was always a little bit ahead of everybody else. Technically, technically. Yeah. Yeah. And, I uh, am also have through the years tried to to bring things to the public that uh, uh, weren't there before. So it's kind of uh, uh, Luke Broadwater once called me the P.T. Barnum of Maryland wrestling or something because I always promoted it so much <laughs> in different ways. Yeah, yeah. You re and we'll get to that topic and talking about promoting wrestling. You have a stalemates. Is that a sweatshirt? Yes, it's a you wonderful wanna... new stalemate from Zach Bogle, who's out nice. in, uh, in Iowa. He's a Cyclone fan, and uh, he started a podcast. Um, he was a high school wrestler, um, admittedly not a uh, college star, but he, uh, he loves wrestling. He's always followed it, and he's an Iowa State fan. He just interviewed Tom Brands, and Tom... Uh, threatened him if he didn't convert to be an Iowa fan. And, uh, and in front of Tom, Zach said he would. But then I read recently where he's still a Cyclone fan. So I'm, uh, I'm a little concerned that if he gets around Tom, we may not see Zach anymore. Please. But it's, his uh, podcast is called Stalemates Show, all one word, Stalemates Show on YouTube. And in just, just about a month or so, uh, he's got almost 700 followers which is really good and so i got yeah that's that, shirts for him and i've jumped on there listened to some of the stuff it's neat it's clean it's straight to the point he's got a good sense of humor he approaches it from a different point of view it's not who's ranked one who's or did this guy get it take down or not it's uh it's more personal about the people that he has on he covered the uh the Willie trials, Willie Saylor from Flo, who left Flo and is being sued by Flo or was being sued. He put the trials on and had uh, interesting and humorous uh, excerpts from the trial and how that was going. He did the Downey situation where uh, uh, there was a couple weeks where Downey was twittering himself out of wrestling yeah. and, and he covered... Uh, he covered a lot of, of what happened, what transpired during that well, he, time. He consolidated all the all the various tweets. Like if you yes. weren't like I was watching it in real time, but if you were not like it's hard to like piece it all together. I wasn't watching it in real time and I really appreciate it. Zach putting a summary together of everything that happened there. He just loves wrestling. The most recent thing he did, and this came up after Dayton Fix's uh situation where he uh was uh suspended from uh, f from Olympic wrestling for a year, uh, and the excuse from the for the negative uh, test was that he took a sip of his father's drink, which was in the wrong refrigerator or something, and uh, yeah. and then Zach got himself in a little bit of trouble, saying uh, we have a uh, um, situation where the uh, uh, the excuse is quite humorous and he you know he didn't buy the excuse but i, I know dayton pretty well and uh right. he would, he's not a he's not a cheater in any way um i think he said we have an oj simpson of wrestling now which didn't go over well Love in it's the order <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't accusing dayton of murder he was just saying that the uh, the excuse was as humorous as if the glove doesn't fit right must uh, acquit so uh, he put two together in a humorous way. I, I kind of know Zach's sense of humor and I really appreciate, I appreciate what he's doing and everything I've ever done was just to uh, promote and develop wrestling. And that's what he's doing as a, as a fan. He put a podcast together. He's got 700 followers and thousands of views. Of course, when uh, Tom Brands was on, that was a very popular podcast. That's one video right now. Yeah. But anybody can see it at a, a stalemates show dot oh. com and uh, I don't know so it's, it's, on the, it's also on the website yeah stalemate show dot com on the website he's got links everywhere he's on Instagram Facebook okay. uh, Twitter he's on all of it so. okay he's a good guy and uh, I told him if he comes east I'll try to get him an interview with Kerry Colat who's not the the most interview friendly kind of guy he's too busy teaching wrestling but uh, uh, if it'll help Navy wrestling I'm sure he'll do it oh absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yeah, because Zach said he would like to come east if if the wrestling season actually gets started this year. He'll he'll want to come. That would be nice. It was actually really great to watch the U.S. Open. I was a little like skeptical with COVID and everything, but the people have been training. If they have the ability to train, they they got in there. They got after it. Now the the quality may have not been that great. I mean, there were some interesting results in there. Yeah, there was, uh, and, and some of the kids did really well. Our uh, Cody Travis wrestled great. I mean, he was, uh, it was a three to one match with Dean Howe, who's a two time NCAA champion. That's yep. that's pretty damn good for his first first match out there. Um, and then uh, Quentin Perez, who's on the RTC at Navy, also did did really well. But my uh, uh, biggest uh, opinion of what was going on was everybody looked huge. I couldn't believe how big some of the guys looked like, like they weren't in the best in mid season, yeah. shape, which they're not. It's the first time they've wrestled since March. So it's uh, and they had two kilos, which is almost five pounds. Yeah. So that does make a difference, but yeah, I mean, everybody came in, they weren't in peak shape, but you know, they got the, got the rust off and it was Austin Kreiser was, 180. Yeah, yeah, he was up to 86 kilos, and I, and he was wearing a far, one of our pet the Fargo singlets. I said he didn't, he wasn't that size. But I I texted Cliff. I said, whose singlet is he wearing? Because he wasn't that size when he when he wrestled for us. And he said uh, he thinks he borrowed it from Kyle Snyder because <laughs> he's Kyle Snyder size. He's 165 pounder. <laughs> wow, big guy. But but all the guys look big. I mean. Uh, yeah. um, when uh, Cody was wrestling, the guys he was wrestling looked looked actually absolutely huge. So, but we'll get it. Hopefully, we'll get a season going, and the guys will be in in real wrestling shape. That would be great. That would be amazing. And seeing Kerry doing his thing, and maybe getting in with Zach would be great too. So yeah, well, I don't know if that'll happen, but we'll see. <laughs> but, uh, oh, so, so I thought I started talking about the drone and Kerry was the first one to get the drone and I liked it so much I I, uh, I saw he, he showed me some of the features you got a button to push you used to have to fly the entire you got a button to push now RTH return to home so you can be a mile away oh. and you can drive at home or you can push RTH and the drone goes to the height that you set it for so that you don't hit any obstructions along the way like trees and this drone comes back to the point at which it started automatically so it's, and it has obstacle avoidance so if something's in its way it, right. it can either stop at that object or go around it so it's really neat so carrie's first used it uh to put a promotional kind of thing of what's going on in the room and one of the uh compliance type people at navy sees the video and says, what are you doing buying a drone? We have a, we have a freeze on now. There's no money to buy the, and Carrie said, I bought it. It's my own drone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's tough times. Uh, the Naval Academy and the military academies have it particularly tough. They've had very rigid restrictions of who can wrestle who and, and when and where. Um, yeah. Practice officially started uh, yesterday and I still don't think the coaches are allowed to put their hands on wrestlers. So you can't get in there and show things physically. You have to, uh, you have to just speak instructions, which is very it, difficult. It's really difficult. And even athletes, oh, you do it too. Yeah. Teaching um, virtually. I mean, it's, yeah, it is what it is, but it's not like the best way to do things. Yeah. And it's hard because you wrestling is all about connecting and, and it's, it's yeah. hard to connect when you're looking through at somebody through a screen and, and yeah. <laughs> now Quentin Perez and Dean Howe on the RTC side of things at Navy, they uh, are allowed to work out with the coaches. And I think it showed, I think, uh, well, Dean didn't have the best performance, but Quentin won a lot of matches. I think he had seven or eight matches the first wow. day of the uh, senior nationals. And, uh, and like I said, Cody, uh, you know, he, uh, he lost the first one three to one against Dean. And, and I thought he had a, close takedown at the end and and possibly a push out it might even have been a little bit closer but he did. that's pretty good performance for his first time out there and quentin and he uh well cody's cody's been training on cody's a hard worker you he could be isolated with nobody right. around. he'd figure out a way to get in shape right. and get exactly. his weight down yeah exactly I'm, I'm excited to see how they how they do if there is a season and if there's not i'm sure they're gonna They'll get on the grind and they'll 
they'll be in good shape when the time comes. Yeah. I know recruiting went well and, um, Oh yeah. Carrie's known for teaching wrestling and teaching how to get it done on the mat and yeah. the mental aspect of it too. He's tremendous at that. But, uh, Look at the recruiting job they did. They're, they're back in New Jersey and Pennsylvania bringing, I mean, uh, Nate Engel did a great job bringing top kids in from all across the country. Everybody likes Nate and, and he brought a lot of state champions in, but they weren't Pennsylvania state champions. You bring a Pennsylvania state champion in, it's a little different than another state out in the Midwest or the West. And uh, um, Kerry's got, you know, good lines of communication to, uh, to the Pennsylvania and the New Jersey guys. And it showed, I mean, these kids want to come to the Naval Academy and wrestle, which is really exciting. And Kerry's going to, Kerry's going to maintain a connection to the Maryland kids too. I know he's talking to a couple of them. Absolutely. And he was doing that at Campbell with low, no resources, essentially. <laughs> no. Now, they didn't so. even have a wrestling room until they got there. I mean, when he got there, there were five kids. They were in out ineligible academically they couldn't go postseason he had five he forfeited five weight classes the whole season and he turned it into the southern conference championship in uh, two years in a row right yeah, yeah. amazing just four, four years it takes a few years but uh if you load up one year at a time in four right. years you're, you're loaded with your guys and, and of course navy returns some pretty pretty good kids i mean cody was a eiwa champion last year so that's good a couple of other kids are Skittle, Skittle's still there, right? Yeah, and Treister and yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Birchmeyer, the heavyweight. Birchmeyer is, is very good. Yeah, he was uh, injured last year, so he didn't do all that he could have done, but uh, he's very talented. He wrestled Isaac Ryder in the finals of the Beast. As, actually, Isaac uh, beat him at the Isaac Beast. Beat him. Yeah, and, but Birchmeyer is very talented, and, and he's a legitimate heavyweight. He should do fine. Um, they've got a uh, really good Cabell, uh, Blaze Cabell. He's, uh, he, he was with Kerry down in uh, Campbell and he'll be the heavyweight coach. And, uh, and he, he, he does, he does a good job. He's really good. They got Mike Evans, of course, from Iowa and the guys that were Lloyd, Lloyd Rogers and Dan Neffer were returning. So, so it's a good staff. Yeah. That's very good. And your connection with Navy has like, even before Kerry has gone a long, long way. Can you, can you share a little bit about how that came to be, came to be? Yeah. Back uh, many years ago. Um, I uh, like around, like around this time. God. Oh, geez. <laughs> You're now, now, I didn't you know you were going to show that <laughs> on this video. So. I have this one video of you in the, uh, no, I don't. Uh, <laughs> the, yeah, it was back then in the 70s. Um, I, I had coached, uh, I had started a program at, uh, at Cardinal Gibbons. They had never had a wrestling program before. And in the first year, we had some really talented athletes. We wrestled Mount St. Joe, who, who always did very well under House Sparks. He brought in lots of talented athletes but he wasn't a wrestling person so i taught the kids at given some wrestling and we went over and had a scrimmage or an unofficial match with uh, with with mount st joe and a lot of our kids did really well against some of the top kids in the wow. uh, msa so so i did that and and then i went on to coach at canesville community college with buck workman um and then mount st joe so during that time right after college um I was running AAU and Federation, U.S. Wrestling Federation, which is the old name before uh, uh, the uh, current US, USA Wrestling um, tournament. I was running tournaments out of Franklin High School, and uh, Ed was the uh, chairman of the Federation back then, the Maryland State Chairman, so he and I would run tournaments together. So he saw um, my organizational skills, and we started working together along with Claude Dar, sorry about that. Um, and then Claude was the coach of Franklin at the time. So what uh, Ed did was bring me down to the Naval Academy and uh, I started working the camps with him. Uh, Ed, Perry. Ed Perry, yeah, I made, uh, uh, I ran at the store for him. I registered people. I, I taught wrestling in, in, in various wow. rooms. We had different sessions. And I did that for like three or four years, getting to know the Naval Academy situation. We were up, we wrestled in the old McDonough Hall up on the 
third floor. It was like 150 degrees in there and they don't wrestle up there anymore. But they had a swimming pool on the floor below and we got in there. Um, so I had established a rela relationship with him. So when I became the coach at um, Mount St. Joe, he wanted to send Greg up, his son Greg up uh, to wrestle for me at St. Joe. So uh, we have a relationship that goes way back uh, to that time. Wow. And then That's Greg funny. was extremely successful. Um, the difficulty coaching somebody like Greg, who's the son of a three-time NCAA champion, is to pull, put the pressure off of him so that he didn't concentrate on the bad things of having to do something that somebody else has done rather than developing himself. We did that successfully, and he was a four-time MIS champion. Um, it was MSA back then, Maryland Scholastic Association. And then he went out to Oklahoma State to wrestle. And that was after I left. Oh, what, Jay? He was a three-time NCAA champion. Ed was, not Greg. Greg okay. did not. Greg didn't stay at Oklahoma State. Um, it was one of the regrets I have leaving uh, when I did, but uh, I didn't get to finish with Greg and send him to the place where, I mean, I love Oklahoma State wrestling too, but I'm not sure that that was the proper fit for him. And unfortunately, and I had this discussion with Greg a month before he passed away. He passed away of the same uh, pancreatic cancer that Ed passed away from. So mm. probably has some genetic connection. But Greg and I had, I had a nice talk and he said those memories of those times uh, wrestling for me and then Alan Smith who followed me were the best times of his life. And that, was That's really a, that, that has to be absolutely amazing to hear your athletes come back and say that. And, and you've had so many different athletes. You were a three-time national prep champion, Mount yeah. St. Joe time national prep champion, and you coached. Mount St. Joe and no Maryland team had ever won the national preps prior to the time I started at Mount St. Joe, 75 and 76. Wow. So that year, and that wasn't our goal. Our goal was to win the Maryland Scholastic Association local tournaments state private school tournament, Baltimore City, all the Baltimore City schools were in it back then. The Washington right. DC wasn't in it back then. And uh, so that was our goal. And, uh, you know, the team at Mount St. Joe uh, was good. They won their dual meets, um, but they didn't win the, they never won, they, MS, Mount St. Joe never won the state uh, individual tournament either until 75, uh -oh. 76. And, uh, and we won all of our dual meets and all of our, I think there were 16 tournaments in a row that we won over the span of time that I was at St. Joe, three years, 1975, six, six, seven, and seven, eight. And then uh, we went up to uh, the national preps at Lehigh and we had these purple singlets on that nobody else had. Purple wasn't a big popular color back then and people would laugh at us because of the color of our singlets. And there's a guy in another purple singlet, like it was a clown and uh, our guys wrestled better than they had ever in their lives. And we won the thing before the semifinals. We outscored. Oh. This was when Blair was in there with postgrads. We didn't have postgrads. And we had all Maryland wrestlers. And we went up there and won the national preps for the first time any Maryland team did it. And then we did it again the next year and the next year, three times in a row. There was 16 tournaments and three national prep championships, three MSA championships. And, and uh, it was like 46 dual meets. We didn't lose anything the whole time I was at St. Joe. So, wow. that's and so that's really carried on. I mean, my guys who wrestled for me came back and coached at St. Joe ever since. It's always been a guy from our programs that's coached to St. Joe, except one year, Brian Murphy came in from Pennsylvania. Great guy. He's a, he's a, Brian, national, uh, Maryland, uh, a national official, wrestling official. Uh, but his year wasn't quite as successful as the guys that were. It, it's a matter of uh, how we did it. And we did it with, uh, well, first of all, always being humble, always having integrity, you know, always uh, respecting the opponent and training like hell, learning the technique first. So uh, the wrestling, and I, I always uh, emphasized the quality of wrestling in the wrestling room is how you get better. We, yeah. we, did, we didn't have 30 and 40 matches back then. We had maybe 12 or 15. Well, in three years, there were 46 dual meets that we had. Um, and yet uh, we went up to the national preps and uh, put them away all three years. It was, That's 
And yeah, three, we had, we had, uh, we had three national prep champions my first year. <laughs> I had uh, five my three years and then uh, three or four other guys that wrestled for me that stayed after I left uh, one national prep championships after that. And a couple of them won the uh, Dapper Dan back then, it was called the Dapper Dan, uh, with, which, which was uh, Pennsylvania State champs against the United States. John Hefner won that and uh, uh, Greg Perry won that. I think Rico Ciparelli, not Rico, no, he had transferred to Blair. It was uh, Louis Ciparelli had really? won the Dapper Dan too. Yeah, so we had really tremendous success. And those guys are still friends for life. And they, you know, most of them keep in contact with me still. So, That's amazing. Yeah. And he is the current coach right now. He was one of your former athletes, Harry Barnaby. Harry was there as a uh, rising junior when I started. Um, and we, he always reminds me, uh, I was working the, uh, Naval Academy camps and the Perry system camps on, at Chestertown. And, uh, and I went and a handful of the St. Joe kids came in and they looked at me and I'm, I'm a couple years out of college and, and they were wondering how things were going to be because they were, uh, fairly successful with House Sparks, but that's like I said, without the technique, they never really won the big tournaments. Sure. Um, and I said, you know, I think I can take you guys and, and we can do better things with good technique. And they kind of laughed at me like, look, who's this little twerp saying that to us? <laughs> and he reminds me now and, he, and, and certainly appreciates the fact that the technique that we uh, brought in, which I learned most of after college working at the Naval Academy camps, I studied Ed would bring in all of the top college coaches from throughout the country. I studied all those coaches, took notes at every session. And, uh, and I was a decent wrestler myself back then. So I was able to put together a system of wrestling where we didn't just teach one move at a time. It was, uh, you know, they call, I think they call it system wrestling now, um, or chain wrestling or, uh, yeah. But what we did was whatever position we were in, we would drill, we would show technique, drill the technique, and then go live with the technique and know what to do in every position. And that yeah. was what made us successful. So like we had a high crotch drill, which the high crotch wasn't in existence in Maryland at that time in high school. Um, you know, things have, a lot of things have changed, but the basics have always stayed the same as Ed used to say, Ed Perry used to say, uh, yeah. base, wrestling's pretty simple. You, you take a guy down if you're on your feet, if you're on the bottom, you get out. And if you're on top, you pin the guy, that's wrestling. But then, of course, the the, tech, the uh, various aspects of it are uh, become really interesting. But there wasn't any high C stuff. And uh, Bucky Workman at Catonsville was really good at uh, creating drills for each piece of technique. And uh, we had this high crotch drill where if you shoot the high crotch, what do you do? If he sprawls, what do you do? If he underhooks, what do you do? If he overhooks, what do you do? Uh, what do you do under every situation? And our guys were fully prepared for whatever situation they faced. Um, and we had a we had a lot of success with bringing in uh, tremendous technique, too. and I I carried that concept over to the path to Fargo, which you and I uh, worked with. Which we started with uh, with Carrie, and I knew that training was going to be the key to making us successful. So uh, it worked. <laughs> we we brought that training in. We brought this uh, teaching of skills in, and uh, we had more All Americans than ever before from Maryland. And this was, and this was teaching kids who didn't have like any background in Olympic wrestling. So it was teaching them from the ground up starting really early on and, and then bringing them along the way and then holding events, tournaments and clinics and camps. And so they got sort of got the whole picture and I'm sure that's probably, you got a glimpse into what Ed was doing. It sounds like, like you studied a lot with, Ed was doing in a lot yeah. of Yeah, from the work. time I graduated college in 70 till 75, five years of every session at the Perry system, uh, learning everything from all the college coaches. And that's, that's where I learned to, I wasn't a uh, very experienced freestyle Greco wrestler. I didn't do any Greco for a freestyle wrestler myself, but I was pretty good at folk style. And I knew that, um, 
we didn't have the regional tournaments and state tournaments in high school back when I was uh, at Milford Mill. Uh, actually, I helped uh, Frank Truchet and John Lowe, my former high school coach at Milford, uh, work in the background getting the uh, state tournament started in Maryland. So I would uh, I would go to meetings with Frank and talk about how we would seed it, how we would group it. And I was like in the background, just, just helping that. And I, that's the way I've always done everything up until the uh, MSWA experience. I was kind of just do my thing in the background. And, right. But um, the, uh, the thing I wanted to say was the, with Ed bringing in all the best is what I tried to do with the path to Fargo. So Pat Santoro, who, had coached at Maryland was anxious to come and get to know the the kids who are participating in the Fargo program. Mike Rogers at F and M would come down all the time. Uh, uh, Carrie, Teague. Carrie Teague. would come in Teague. all the time. Teague would come in all the time. Carrie McCoy would come in all the time. And we, I just made use of all the guys with all of the experience and all the success. And uh, and then I at the in the beginning and then I transferred it to you would put together. Uh, the program of what we wanted to accomplish at each step along the way, make sure we had all of the gut wrenches and all the defensive gut wrenches, all the takedowns, all the uh, takedowns, the turns, the combinations and uh, transitioning. And we, you know, we train kids like, like, like they should be trained. And all those kids who participate in the path to Fargo, whether they did anything at Fargo or not, would come up to me all the time and say, man, the training was the key. And then everybody wanted me to let people come participate in that and not participate in the Fargo program. Well, I got involved in the Fargo program because I went to a state tournament at, at uh, McDonough one year and there were like 20 kids. I said, <laughs> if, but nobody knew how to, how to get in it or what to right. do. And, you know, of course the top kids, uh, would always know what to do and find a way to do it. Evan Savan, you know, he wasn't one of our original guys, but he knew to, what to do to get in there. Unfortunately, he hurt his knee the first year that we were doing stuff. But uh, um, so I said to myself, uh, the association either shouldn't put all this effort into a Fargo program or they should do it right. And that's right. when I created this path to Fargo, which started with uh, tr uh, tournaments to get kids involved locally and then training and then and, and we developed over the years a way to make it better and better bringing in the other people and uh, starting coaches clinics back then where to try to get more coaches involved where and we tried to work with clubs throughout the state and we reached out to western maryland where the shuffles and Osiases were yep. and we went to the eastern shore and had a tournament down there at decatur and we were up at harford county and and we went to southern maryland we made sure the entire state was involved and it was a really uh, uh thorough exhausting program for us and successful in terms of numbers. I mean, you know the numbers. I don't. I don't keep track of stuff like that. But I know we have it over a hundred All Americans at Fargo, which is in just a few years. Here's get over a hundred. Yeah. The, and, the and number, though, I thought was always how many participants we got in the tournaments, clinics, and camps leading up. And because we had over five, there was one year I think we had over five hundred kids, and that's a. For, we were talking about April, May, yeah. June. That's a lot of kids staying involved in wrestling after. Yeah. And, then, and that's why we had big numbers. We had delegations of 70, 60, 70 kids. Yeah. Um, people were wondering, how does a state like Maryland have that many kids? And well, it was organized, like you said. We had a process. And I think the biggest thing, though, which parents always appreciate was they, they knew exactly how to get there, where it was, how much does it cost, where does their kid have to be on week one all the way through week, you know, 20. Yeah. And that was the biggest thing, I think. That yeah. And they all <laughs> expressed that, you know, they said, oh, now I, now I see why Mount St. Joe was so successful because of the same, same type of organizational types of things. It's, uh, you know, and then, and then of course, uh, the issue with integrity and, and building character, which always in, in my mind were, were critical, important aspects, which pissed a couple people off who weren't, who didn't have the integrity that they should have or weren't of strong mind and character. So, uh, you know, we had a few of those, but 90, 95% of the kids 
really enjoyed it, participated. We got big numbers. I think at the biggest year, we went up to 70 kids going out to yeah. Fargo, which people complained about. You're taking kids that shouldn't go. You know, the same people who say you don't get better unless you go to these things said you shouldn't take those kids. And all the kids got better whether they won matches in Fargo not and uh, and and proof of that is how many maryland kids started going to division one programs in college i mean well over a hundred in just a couple of years i mean it's amazing because that i've kept a long time and that that is that's over 200 i think that's over 200 at yeah this point. it's unbelievable, it's unbelievable. That, that's what i concentrated on back when i was at, at st joe where could count on less than one hand how many kids went on to wrestle in college from a good program like St. Joe back then. And out of my program, 11 of my kids, and there were only 12 weight classes at the time, went on to wrestle at Division One programs. That, that's something I'm very proud of. They, they did that. That and the fact that they came back and, uh, and, and coached at various junior league programs and high school programs and, 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 and at St. Joe. So. And that's like the true legacy a true tradition and legacy is when your athletes come back to the same program, they're coaching like coach Harry Barnaby. He's, he just won his fourth state title, fourth consecutive state title. And you know, that all represents that four of 30. The first one was 75, 76 Mount St. Joe's had 30 state championships in since that time. It's about 40 years now. And, uh, and four, uh, four straight ones under Harry recently. So. So 30 state titles in 40, 45 years, 45 years, roughly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and it's, and you have four Mount St. Joe guys at the Naval Academy right now. Yeah. That's a first too. Um, I put that out on Facebook the other day. Yeah. We have a record number of uh, Mount St. Joe guys on the roster. Of course, Cody Tribus is an EIWA champion. He'll wrestle, but his brother, Kyle, who's my drone teacher, um, (laughs) had three concussions last year so he's mm-hmm. ineligible for live competition he's there and paul warner who uh, would do anything to help the program wrestled heavyweight had to put on like six pairs of underwear to make the to, to weigh enough to be a heavyweight in high school uh he's working out with the team now and he'll help the heavyweights there because he'll jump through hoops he'll do whatever gary said and ethan stern who his senior year uh, turned his wrestling career around and, and academically did great. He got into naps and now he's on the roster. So we have four St. Joe guys on the roster, which is really exciting for, for me. One of, one of whom is a captain. And we haven't had a captain of the Naval Academy since from uh, Mount St. Joe, at least since uh, Guy Zanti, who was one of my uh, national prep champs, went to, went to the Naval Academy. He is one of the ones who uh, joined us for the trip to the Olympics that you uh, talked about. Uh- <laughs> so, guy so, was a captain. Yep, all this history, 30 state championships in 45 years, four consecutive, the last four consecutive were won by Mount St. Joe. All this history is etched forever, but you have all these unwritten relationships that you keep talking about with people that you've really developed over the years. Not like not even back then, they're coming back to you 30, 40 years later and telling you, um, how they, how much they appreciate what you did for them. And then they're coming back to the program. Can you share some, inf- some, shed some light on really just what those relationships mean to you? And, and, uh, cause well, I think that- that's the most rewarding part of coaching. You've affected somebody's life. Uh, um, Tim Haney is a, probably the best example of that. He, uh, was a senior my first year and uh, a good wrestler. And when I was working with Hal over the summer, Hal Sparks, who was there before me, he would say, this is one guy you probably got to get rid of to, uh, to, to clean the house. I said, why? He said, well, he smokes marijuana and this and that. So I said, well, we'll see what we can do. And uh, my uh, effort went to turning Tim around and, uh, he uh, he didn't come from a, a wealthy family, and we would be running back in those days. You could run around the community around Mount St. Joe through the cemetery, and all. You don't do that these days. It's not in the best uh, section of Baltimore, but I guess they do still run in some parts of it. But uh, but Tim would always run in these old, torn, beat up uh, tennis shoes, and uh, 
so when Christmas came around, I went and bought him a pair of wrestling shoes. I mean, I wasn't making any money back then either, basically. I mean, that's why I ended up having to leave. But um, uh, I just put him in his locker and he knew where they came from. And uh, he, <laughs> it's amazing. He he reminds me every time I see him what that meant to him. He He never gave me one second trouble. He did everything we asked of him. He trained as hard as anybody. And he went on to be a coach of a Anne Arundel County Junior League program. And he uh, went on to, the, to work at the post office and became a national regional manager of, of uh, sports. And every time I run into him, he says, I can't tell you how much it meant to me to get those uh, tennis shoes. Uh, it was tennis shoes that I gave him, not wrestling shoes. And so he had a brand new pair of running shoes. And, you know, stuff like that is really meaningful. That really is. It's in those stories. You can't, you can't, even, you probably have a million of those, those stories that you, yeah. you have. Well, Guy never would have been headed to the Naval Academy, <laughs> Guy Zanthi, um, if it wasn't for what we had done for him. And, and then uh, we hooked him up with Ed Perry and he got thrown out of his house his senior year in high school because uh, he was doing stuff that his father didn't approve of. And Ed took him in as a, like a, stepchild and uh, saw the value of what uh, uh, what uh, guy's character was like and he made sure he got into the Naval Academy and uh, he became a midshipman he he served on a battleship that's the, the first war in Iraq he sent he, he, he sent the cruise missiles down the street that made he was telling me how he could turn right on different streets and left and and hit it and go into Saddam Hussein's apartment and scare them to death and he did all that and then he got he went into the he uh, became a, a Navy person and got stationed over overseas and now he's married to another uh, midship person who uh, uh, they've had they've, they now have four kids and his oldest is a junior at the Naval Academy. He's a rifleman and he just won uh, athlete of the week two weeks in a row from the NAAA at the Naval Academy. So, yeah, our ties go way back. Our successes go way back. And you know, we had some uh, some great things happen over the years. That's amazing. That's really amazing. And I had Butch Keezer. Butch Keezer was went to the Naval Academy. And he told me the story. Well, I reminded him of the story you told me, <laughs> which, by the way, I read that that article you wrote about your trip to Montreal. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming you, your relationship with, with Butch started because you, you were in contact with Ed and you just yeah. had strong ties with the Naval And Butch is just a phenomenal person. Um, as good as they get. He really is. Can you share a little bit about your relationship with him? And because in that in that interview, when I talked to him, he shared with me he's he thinks of you like family, you and Ed. Well, he was of course a lot closer to Ed than than me because uh, he worked with him every day for four years. But yeah, I got to know him down there, and then uh, he made the Olympic team. Yeah, we I knew him in high school when he was at Brooklyn Park High School. Uh -huh. My coach would always talk about these two Keezer brothers at Brooklyn Park. We. There was never any competition between Baltimore County and Anne Arundel County. You know, these were primitive days back in the, I graduated Milford in 66. So, you know, no regional tournament, no state tournaments, no dual meet championships. Uh, wow. You know, we had county championships and Milford, when I was captain of the team there, we did win our county championships, but uh, we always talked about the Keezers. And then of course I knew him uh, when I started spending time at the Naval Academy. And then I knew uh, that he won a spot on the uh, Olympic team. And when he graduated the Naval Academy, he became a Marine and the Marines have a special way to uh, uh, allow uh, you know, Olympic competitors a way to right. practice and train. So Ed just said to me one day, let's go, let's, let's go. And Butch was up at uh, Montreal. It's different today. You can't just say, let's go to Tokyo and do what we did. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, we jumped, uh, Ed rented a Winnebago. I went out and bought food and a uh, guy, Zanti, who again was like a stepchild to Ed, Greg Perry, Ed's son who wrestled for me and, uh, and Rex, Ed's father, who also was a three-time NCAA champion. Um, all let's see it was me and guy and greg and rex and uh -oh. ed jumped in the winnebago traveled drove up to uh to <laughs> montreal parked in a uh, 
in an RV camp and made our way into the, into the Olympic Village. And we called Butch and um, he met us. And back then, security in 76 wasn't the same as it is now. Right. He said, you want to go see the, uh, you know, the dorms where we live and the, and the dining hall? He took us through the whole, he's preparing <laughs> to wrestle the best right. guys in the world and took time out to meet us, which was so significant to us. Right, right. It, it, it's one of the most significant trips I've ever participated in in my life. And, um, but it meant I learned more now that he it meant as much to him as it meant to us he was so thrilled that we went up he there was for him and he had a great tournament he he was he was tearing it up and then uh gable was the uh, coach at the time and there's a story about what happened he was told uh butch was told uh how many points he could lose by mm -hmm. and still win the gold medal yeah not what you tell somebody. I don't right. know what Gable told him that or somebody, but it was wrong. Whatever it, it was, a black mark system, black mark. Different, different than the way it's scored now. And he thought he won the thing, even losing that last match to the Russian who he had beaten before. And he ended up with a silver medal. And that silver medal, like so many things in life, meant so so much to him. And and what and what he didn't accomplish and what he did accomplish and and then he went on and became a leading salesperson for IBM and very successful and he's retired from IBM now and he is one of the people that I um, I didn't talk about uh, the Maryland wrestling news I started this Maryland wrestling news back in 75 I think and we would always honor uh, a leading how did, how did you get into the what, what gave you the idea to start that again back then there was no internet and I was always P.T. Barnum of Maryland Wrestling, according to uh, <laughs> Luke Broadwater. I was promoting the Mount St. Joe program. I was promoting Maryland Wrestling. It was always about promoting the kids. Sure. And I always knew that the Maryland wrestlers, from my own personal experience, I was talented and good at wrestling. I didn't, I won every dual meet match at, uh, for two years at, at Milford Mill. But again, we didn't have state and, and, uh, and regional tournaments. But um, I didn't really know the technique that I later learned sure. working with all these great college coaches. So, but I knew that the talent was in Maryland and that the uh, instruction and the opportunities to get better didn't exist like they do today. They're, we're in much better shape today. Uh, we were in much better shape a couple of years ago than we are today. <laughs> but right. uh, but uh, I knew that, um, Maryland wrestlers physically, mentally were just as good as anywhere. And they just needed the exposure to what it takes to become good. So I was always promoting that. And that's where Maryland wrestling news came from. This is the uh, picture that Ed Safeld did of Butch on the cover of Mount of Maryland. Wrestling. I did this for like four years. That up? Um, but that, the picture of Butch. That's amazing. And we put the accomplishments and everything. And then inside we did stories and we had stories sent in from different parts of the state by mail. We, we didn't have the internet. So I had representatives in different parts of the state send me what happened in their county. So we have county championships in here and we have county. So, the AWL thing in there. That what? The MJ well thing. Maryland Little. Junior Wrestling League stories. Oh. Oh. I don't know who wrote that one. But, uh, or Levin. It, yeah. And uh, Al Colhafer would submit stuff to being the chairman of the Wrestling Federation at that time. Olympic trials results. The the uh, wow. the uh, the Poland trip is in here that where that uh, that picture's from, and here's the picture in the Olympic Village of uh, 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 everybody but me at uh, lifting a bar with Butch, him showing <laughs> us around the weightlifting room. Bernie Levin did the uh, Maryland Junior Wrestling League story, so we had people contributing from all over. Did that one? I'd, here's one with uh, Harry Barnaby, who gave him credit. Uh -huh. That was after he won the national. Looking Premier. young there. <laughs> and he was younger. I don't know. Bob Tannenbaum from the DC area. We spread it. Wow. We spread it around. Ray Finch from Carroll County. We did a story on him. He was one of the tougher wrestlers back then. He went on and wrestled for the University of Pennsylvania. So that was one of the promotional things that sure. I did back then. I did something similar much later on in 2000. And while well, I was promoting Mount Matt Madness, I guess. Um, we started Maryland Wrestling Talk. I don't know if you remember that. I had Luke and uh, Billy uh, uh, Buckeye come to my house and we hooked up with a radio. And this was again wow. when the internet was just starting. Uh, Artist first radio out in Ohio. And we would talk for an hour 
about what's going on in Maryland wrestling before you could go to the internet to a forum or to Facebook and, and see. And uh, it was the first inter international news talk show of anywhere that I knew of. And the guy at Artist First, you know, we didn't charge anything. It was, it was free. And uh, the guy at Artist First said, you should sell advertising. I said, wait, you got Maryland wrestling. What are we gonna have a hundred people? <laughs> he, he looked at the statistics and he said, like one of the shows had a hundred thousand listeners that they could wow. tell by the IP addresses because people were listening from all over the world to the show. I was shocked. I never thought. And then local people would say to me, I really, I think we did it on Sunday night. I don't know, one night of, of, during the week. And people would say, I really enjoyed listening to that on the way to work or on the way back to work. They would, you could listen somehow. I guess people could download the, the, the broadcast and then, and then take it to their, in their cars and listen to it. So, so that was a, Good, big promotional nothing compares to the coach you know if i remember for anything in wrestling it's for my coaching and that's what i did the best and uh, of course mount matt madness was a good tournament and people know me from running mount matt madness but that's uh that was just to give opportunities to the local wrestlers to wrestle guys from uh, a variety of states and from the small to let the small school kids wrestle the big school kids and the private school, you know put them all together into that tournament so i did that and that's, that's going on this year would be tw year what? This would have been the 17th year. Oh, 17. Yeah, but I, I've stopped it now and uh, put it to rest. We, we, uh, for COVID or for, for good? No, no, I've just done it enough. So, uh, yeah, it's a lot of work. Really? <laughs> I didn't know. That. Yeah, all year long, I would think of ways to try to make that tournament better than any other tournament. And we, uh, you know, and still we have our antagonists who say, it wasn't really that good of a tournament. You didn't really have that good of kids, you know, and it was so meaningful to all the kids that participated and the coaches who participated loved it too. And uh, yeah, they loved the coaches room too, the food that we would serve. It was amazing. Uh, <laughs> I always enjoyed that food too. <laughs> yeah. We tried to do everything and we were the on the leading edge of uh, online tournament results. Uh, I hooked up with Desi Kaplan who, mm -hmm used to run the Hammond tournament that Mount Menes grew out of. And Desi uh, and I would sit down and talk about how we could make it better. And, uh, and some of the stuff that he incorporated in cap wrestling, which was his baby, uh, he took to flow wrestling when they hooked up together. Wow. And a lot of the tech, technical stuff at Flow Wrestling has come from Desi Kaplan, who's still, he, I think he runs hundreds of tournaments a year now. And he always ran Mount Matt Madness and he and I, used Mount Matt Madness as a, a way to how, how to improve the uh, technical aspects. We, well, ours, ours was pretty good. We, uh, you know, the, the most important thing to me in running the tournament was to have the spectators know what's going on. Because sure. it's like the only sport in the world, you, you don't have, an, <laughs> you you have, don't no have Neil Edelberg on your back of your singlet or anything. Sometimes they do now. Um, so you, you don't know what weight is on a particular mat. If you, if you only know your wrestlers, that's all you – so I, uh, a couple of our tournaments, we made name tags and put them on uh, towers uh, yeah. and every, every mat. <laughs> That was a lot of, that was a big struggle printing the entries the day before the tournament at a printer so that they were, every wrestler would have his name tag to hang up at, so the spectators could see that. So we wanted the wrestlers to see it. We wanted the, the coaches to know, and we wanted the wrestlers to know. I mean, when we first started, the tower would have bout numbers. So it would say bout one. Uh, we would have a tower for Matt one, a tower for Matt two, a tower for Matt three, and we would put bout numbers up so the wrestlers would know what mat to go to. That's the old way of doing things. We developed into a, a computer screen where uh, we knew who was coming, who was on deck on Matt one, who was on deck on Matt two, who was, and that's what uh, Desi and I worked together and developed. And wow. he took it, he took it to Flow Wrestling. So that, uh, and then Flow Wrestling, and I don't know whether Desi was involved or not. You can follow an entire team with notifications to your cell phone now. They didn't have cell phones back in uh, 2004 when we started. There were no, there were no uh, mobile phones. So, so we were kind of uh, the pioneer of get, getting that, getting that done also. Man, that's disappointing. Um, what, what is Harry going to do this year? Well, if there's a season, yeah, he... this year, there's no chance of doing anything because nothing's going to start until January, probably. But uh, in the future, he'll put a, a tournament together that he'll run uh, like a dual meet tournament, invite eight teams and, and let, you know, guarantee the kids more matches. At, Saint, at Mount Matt Madness, you were guaranteed two matches. So things have changed over time. I still like the format of an individual tournament and getting a champion 
the the best just like i uh personally believe that the state should have a champion at each weight class instead of a big school champion small school champion private school champion but i don't know if that'll ever happen because the people who are disadvantaged by that situation always vote against it right but i think it would be great to say i am number one in maryland All and there's there's a few this is a very few states that actually do that. It's many states have the big school, small school. Virginia has six or six seven, different divisions now, which is crazy to me. But the participants they don't like that. California <laughs> has one. They have one, right? And, and that's a that's as big as the entire East Coast. They have one amazing. state champion at each weight. I like right. that format. So. I mean, yeah. you don't have as many champions that way, but the, the popular way of doing things is to make as many champions as you can and give trophies out as much as you can i believe in a really nice award to a really spectacular performance <laughs> jack shorts yeah right <laughs> whole works insurance sure, yeah that always made made those awards look great yeah yeah and we always had our old timers come back uh, carrie mccoy would come in hand out awards K kelly ward would always help us out his son alex went to mount st joe and uh, you know, all those guys. Whoops. There we go. I guess we're timed out. <laughs> uh, almost. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate your time, Neil. And um, one more question, though. One more. And this this is such a like a unique thing. I, I, I thought about this because I number one, I wanted the reason I wanted to have an interview with you. Number one you you were like a mentor to me like when i first moved to maryland i i didn't know anybody here and i was i was still trans transitioning as a runner into wrestling so i was like it's funny because the way you tell your story is kind of similar to mine like i was okay wrestler but i was i was primarily a runner and when i came here i just studied everybody obviously i had carrie to study and all the other people that you brought in pat carrie t all the I mean, it was amazing. And that's so even really after I finished coaching, I would come to the, to the Colac club and I would say, where is every, I thought all the coaches would, would get, that's the way I was. I wanted to, I wasn't coaching, but the way Kerry teaches, there's some similarities to the way I used to coach and the way he teaches. And, and, and the basic similarity is the chain wrestling type of thing, but also the, uh, the teaching of the skill, and the specifics of each individual skill and position and then drilling it with good drills and then going live with it. Those three steps are really important in developing. So important. Yeah. And so. Some coaches don't get that. They no, never, they never still teach. I, it's the way I learned in high school. Here's a switch, right. free the arm, put the hand through the crotch. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I was in high school, we learned the roll, the switch, you know, but, and then, uh, uh like I said, after college, I, I went to Rutgers because my brother bet me that I couldn't get in, which was a really good reason to go. I became a guidance counselor after that because I had such poor guidance. But uh, I transferred to Maryland. And of course, when I transferred, Goble Klein was in my weight class. And uh, so I didn't do much wrestling there. I just worked out. Sully Krause was the coach and he was never even in the room. He was in the sauna. Um, so I didn't learn anything at Rutgers, very little, and very little at Maryland. And so in 1970s, when I really, my uh, curve went way up in, in my learning, my learning curve. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. And so in 1976, you had the opportunity to see Butch Kieser win an Olympic medal. Yeah. 40 years later, <laughs> you had the opportunity, you weren't there in Rio, I don't believe, right? You no, I didn't there. go. But 40 years later, you had the opportunity Kyle, Kyle yeah. and Helen, two athletes that were involved in the Path to Fargo program. That I did go out to Vegas and see them win the world championship. That so is true. You did do that. That was really good. That is really unique in the fact that you've been, a, not, not only have you been involved in so many people's lives for that period of time, but to be, to have so much impact on, on so many people and then have this program that you developed with Carrie and we carried on and just two Olympic gold medalists. How it was amazing. And, uh, you know, you don't, it's mysterious how the world works. It is. When we were doing the path to Fargo, Kyle wasn't a part of it. No, he and, wasn't. And uh, I had to speak to him 
I spoke to his father. I had to convince them that being a part of it would make him a better wrestler. He was a good counsel and he, and he was a war hawk um, where they didn't believe in Olympics. They didn't believe in freestyle uh, or I, I don't know if they do there now or not, but they didn't believe in freestyle or Greco there. So he, he didn't get pushed into it from his training side. And uh, I had Kerry call him, called the father. We talked to his brother. Um, and we got him to be at the Path to Fargo. And the, we used to have the Path to Fargo training sessions. I used to try to hold them at the various colleges to get the kids accustomed to dorm life and college life so that they could see what they're going to be getting into after they finish their high school careers. At every college program that we trained at, I made sure I brought college guys in. We brought Navy guys in. We brought Maryland guys in. We brought American guys in. I made and if they and if they weren't available, I would go out and find guys to come in and train with Kyle because he was head and shoulders above most of the other local people. Yeah. And that made him so much better. And he wasn't even involved. He never wrestled a freestyle tournament before no. the Path to Fargo stuff. And uh, who knows what would have happened if, if we didn't do the Path he, to Fargo. He I mean, he, he could be a good wrestler never having been a part of any program because he's so sure. talented. But being a part of that really uh, was a big shot in the arm for his track. But if you remember, he, wanted to, he didn't want to do it his second cadet year because he wanted to go to football camp. But we convinced him to participate and he he guess what he quit football after that <laughs> he well, quit football. I, I mean he, he could have my goal wasn't to get him to quit anything but my goal was to get him to participate because i knew he was one one of the most talented guys ever in the state of maryland probably the most and uh and two he really needed the training and he got it and i knew i could get it for him i wasn't training like i said i'm i'm don't have much experience with freestyle guys would ask me questions and I would say, hmm, ask Harry, <laughs> <laughs> ask Jay, <laughs> but I made sure they got the training that they needed and the attention that they needed. So, so uh, amazing 40 year span and you, you got to witness three Olympic medalists. That's pretty Actually, awesome. Uh, back. I didn't even mention this back in, in 76 after my kids had gone to Poland to bring back that, pictures and had that experience uh, uh um harry went to uh the national i took i took uh, uh the maryland national freestyle team out to to uh, iowa city the the uh, U usa wrestling nationals were in iowa city back at that time i think it was still the u.s wrestling federation and uh so i took harry out there and he was a greco national champion after the experience that he had in, uh, wow. and and out in out in the uh, uh the fargo equivalent which was free fargo it was in iowa city so we drove out there kevin calabucci was on we had a bunch of really good eddie bailey was on that team wow. um I think the Jarris brothers were on that team. Kevin Calabucci. Uh, it was a, it was a great group of guys. And I was Ed Perry was in charge of the Federation at that time. He said, Neil, take them out there and coach them. So, so I took them and uh, that was our first good experience out there. Well, I, I think we had 11 guys back at that time. So I didn't start fresh as a, as a rookie when I took the program over to do the path to Fargo. I had one uh -huh. year experience. You had, a, you had one year experience. <laughs> <laughs> what did Maybe. you say? I didn't hear One chip in Harry. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, that's right. I think he was our only champion that year out of the 11. But that's even Eddie Bailey, every time I see him now, he's definitely not looking the same. He's bald. He had a nice head of hair back then. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> he always reminds me of that time. It was a great time. I think John Dolch was on that team, too. We had a bunch of really talent. And there again, I was saying, with, there's so much talent in the state of Maryland. And uh, John yeah. Morrison, who's here now from Oklahoma State, who hooked up with uh, Teague and he hooked up with Bullis, he's got the energy and the knowledge to uh, to do a lot of good things. So hopefully, uh, hopefully some good, and he knows a lot about the path to Fargo because uh, other than the new people who are, are running things, he's talked to a lot of people who know the value of what that was. So, so he, uh, he, he has the ability to, 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 to make it a, available to the kids again, because the kids are really missing out on not having uh, an organized training program. Uh, and he's at the DMV RTC at College Park with He's Helen. the RTC coach at College Park now with, with Helen. Helen, which is a great thing for the program there. 
Yeah, yeah. Alex Clemson's doing some good stuff there. Bringing he's got good recruits. Good, some good recruits. Um, when I was at Ironman last year, I saw this kid from Missouri, Cal Miller, and I said he's a talented kid, and I told uh, uh, Alex about it, but and he knew him because he's from the yep. University oh, right. of Missouri. But he said he's going to just go with his brother Ethan, who uh, Ethan had committed to Missouri two weeks ago. And I can, I communicate to Cal from time to time. Uh, we're Facebook friends, and uh, you know I. Uh, I had uh, originally said, you know, I know they like water sports. I said we have the Chesapeake Bay here. If you if you like water sports, you you can uh, you can get the same experience on the water here as you get in the lakes out near Missouri. And uh, but but Alex said that Cal was just going to follow his brother. Well, two weeks ago, Ethan decommitted from Missouri and he's committed to Maryland. So Alex is successful at attracting a really talented kid. And then Cal, who's equally talented, who's a rising senior this year, is going yeah. to now follow his brother. To Maryland rather than follow him to Missouri. So that's a good start. And then he's brought in a couple other nationally ranked, you know, top 100 type of kids. So that's, that's a good step forward. That is a good step. And then you have Carrie over at the Academy and you have Teague down here in DC. And so there's a lot of good things happening. Frank Beasley over in George Mason. There's a lot of great things happening right now at yeah. that level. I don't know the Beasley. I don't know the uh, George Mason coaches. So I'm not, I'm not as familiar with that program but we've got two st joe kids there now neil yeah. schuster's there and uh austin austin uh just just uh transferred there from frank is, is a great austin. guy got to know his family is their two kids go to the club that i teach at so i've got to know them pretty and well and you know austin well austin stiff and austin very, yeah very talented and hopefully he's got he'll meet with some success there exactly yeah. exactly well, I really appreciate your time, Neil. Thanks, oh, thanks again. And thanks for asking me. It's so great to catch up with you. I know we've we chat here and there, but we yeah, we don't see each other much lately. Anybody really? But <laughs> are you? Uh, this will be up on your YouTube page. This How, will be what's the name of your YouTube page, so I can J O Wrestling. J O Wrestling. Okay. Yep. So YouTube.com. That's not Junior Olympic, is it? That's no. <laughs> use it with Jordan Oliver because Jordan Oliver, yeah. But what does the Joe, J O stand for? Joe is my Korean last name. Oh, oh, okay. I didn't know that. So I just it sounds better than Lavalley, I think. I don't know. Everybody I like Lavalley. Lavalley, but <laughs> there was a good Lavalley in the Senior Nationals this week. I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> it's pretty tough. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Not related though. People, people always ask me that though. Yeah, I think his name's Jay, isn't it? No, what is, what is no, his first uh, name? I forgot. I forgot his name. But yeah, people, people, or they can, they actually confuse me, even though our first names aren't even the same. And they say, hey, did you compete this weekend? I'm like, no. <laughs> well, your, uh, your technique videos are impressive. So a lot of people are sure getting to know you with your connection with Cliff Keen and, and the videos that you're presenting. So that's great. Thanks. Thank you. Well, trying to keep it going and bigger things coming in the works. You'll be the next PT Barnum of Maryland wrestling. If you like <laughs> <laughs> I hope Luke sees this. Game yeah. I'll, I'll, we'll <laughs> okay. All right. All right, Neil. Have Take care of yourself. Stay healthy. You too.